Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Iran Brook Show, and I'm, I'm particularly excited uh, to be talking today with uh, God Saad. We, we were introduced by uh, Mark Pellegrino last summer, and we've been trying to coordinate a time to talk, and it's finally here. So welcome, God. Good to have you on the Iran Brook Show. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be with you. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, this. one of the things that strikes me at looking at your bio is the parallels between your life and my life. There seem to be really interesting parallels. We're both, we were both born in the same part of the world, not that far from each other. Uh, we both emigrated and left. Uh, we both became atheists. Um, we're both honorary members, I guess, through Dave Rubin of the intellectual dark web, although I think <laughs> you probably belong there more than I do. Um, and they're just, a, a, you know, I think we have a similar attitude towards Islam and towards religion generally and, and towards a lot of things. So uh, it, it is kind of it, the journeys I find I find kind of fascinating. But you, you do beat me in one dimension. Yeah. You live in Southern California. I don't. Well, I don't anymore. So oh, you don't. I, no, I have moved to Puerto Rico. Oh, okay. So now there's absolutely zero reason for me to be envious of you. Well, I don't know. You you live in the cold of Toronto, so uh, Montreal, 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 even worse. <laughs> so it does the cold, but. Uh, no, I love. I, I, I'm enjoying Puerto Rico. So, and and in terms of um, in terms of taxes, you should be very, 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 very jealous of me. Um, we can <laughs> we can talk about that offline. Sure. sure. <laughs> but uh, so uh, yeah, I, I moved here recently. I you also left the Middle East at a younger age than I did, and I um, I visited Beirut after un, un, uninvited. Uh, after you ah, had right. after you had left, so I was in Beirut in 1982 um, as part of my military service in the Israeli army. So, uh, well, the story is that had I had my father won the argument with my mother as to where to <laughs> emigrate out of Lebanon, he he was certainly uh, happy to move to Israel because we have a lot of family there. Yeah. Uh, had he won that argument, then I would have been with you probably. Uh, I'm guessing I'm a bit younger than you. You're three uh, years younger than me. You were born three, in Okay, so yeah. I would have been at exactly the age of my first year That's of right. military service. And so I would have been the, and of course I speak Arabic, so I would have been the first guy into Lebanon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a ton to talk about because I, cause I know... Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now that we're both interested in, and I think, at least it seems like there's a lot of overlap in our views on. I'm also at some point want to talk about evolutionary psychology, partially yeah. because of my ignorance in the topic and partially because I, I'm trying to fit it in to kind of the framework I come at things from and, and see how it all uh, works together. But let, let's just start with some of the um, kind of the political issues and the whole issue of free speech and, and how you came to this issue, you know, you're an academic, you're doing research. I mean, I didn't read your bio because everybody can find it and it's amazing. I mean, uh, the, the number of publications as, as a former academic, uh, the number of publication is stunning. Um, and that's another parallel. We're both, we both taught at business schools. I left early, but we both taught at business schools and um, I, I never had that kind of publication list. Maybe, maybe I would have gotten tenure if I had that. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, a, a number of books. So uh, look God up. He's, got a, he's on Wikipedia, but his bio on the Concordia University website is, is, very, uh, is very amazing. Plus, you're a Twitter god and you're a, you're a YouTube phenom, so uh, I'm jealous on those two. I'm still I'm trying to catch up. I don't up. sleep much. I don't sleep much. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, okay. If you want me to start with the yeah. sort of how, how I got to uh, move to weigh in the freedom of speech issue, yeah. I mean, there are several ways to, to address this. Uh, let me start with sort of the more uh, deeply personal one. So, uh, there is a book uh, that by Eric Byrne, I think, uh, that looks at something called transactional analysis. What is this? What are the key scripts that define your life? In the same way that an actor receives a script and he has to, you know, play that particular sure. role. Sure. Uh, and so that particular form of psychoanalysis tries to look at what are sort of the defining scripts that shape the trajectory that you take in life. And uh, in, in sort of being introspective, the, I think the, the one word that maybe captures my trajectory best is the word freedom. And I'll give different examples of how that manifested itself in, in my life. 
uh, in very, very different domains. So uh, when I used to be a, a, a very competitive soccer player, I used to play the central midfield role where I sort of, the, the number 10 role where yep. I sort of freely move around yep. the field. Yep. Whenever and I score have, the goals. I scored not. I wasn't the top scorer. Okay. I scored goals, but I was much more the playmaker, the okay. guy who touched the ball. Oh, so a midfielder. Okay, okay. Not, not I the tried to striker. Yeah. 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 Now, whenever I would have a coach who would impose some positional restrictions on me, <laughs> uh, you know, you're gonna play a bit more to the left. You're gonna cover this guy. Suddenly, that completely incapacitated me because my ability to freely create, yep. float around, which was probably my biggest. Uh, skill uh, yeah. was lost. So here is one form of freedom uh, that really defined whether I played really well or not. Then when I became an academic, uh, the idea of only publishing in these four journals because that's what you're supposed yeah. to do if you're in this field, I found it terribly constraining. I wanted to have the intellectual freedom to navigate through different landscapes and therefore I ended up having the career path that I ended up having. And then when it comes to freedom and the way that you use the term, uh, I despise having come from the background that I come from in the Middle East, any intrusions to what I think is great about the societies that I immigrated to, right? The fact that yep. we're supposed to be free. And so then add to that the fact that I'm someone who uh, maybe rightly or wrongly can simply not stand bullshit right I'm, I'm i'm offended i'm genuinely angered and which is not a good thing it's not it, it raises your blood pressure it makes you upset at many things it's, rather than not right it's it's but it's also intellectual honesty it's a it's it's a i think it's a it's a really important characteristic so you know uh, having a good bullshit finder Detect detector exactly. is 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 valuable i think in life it's valuable to your own thinking but it's also it also makes you an honest player. It makes you somebody who, you know, doesn't stand for bullshit. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And so because of all that, as I started developing a, you know, a, a reasonably broad platform because of all the social media, I thought that it was imperative for me to weigh in on all the intrusions to freedom that we are seeing, whether it be in the university or in the greater society. And of course, as you might imagine, there is a terrible cost to be to be had when oh, you yeah. speak the way that I do. Yeah. Uh, now, it could come in very direct forms, such as you receive a lot of hate mail and threats and so on, but it could come in more subtle forms, whereby perhaps a uh, university can't fire you because you're tenured and you, you are who you are, but there are ways they can ostracize you. There are other jobs that you could have gotten sure. that no longer... And so, but when I weigh the calculus, my most important sort of currency is when I go to bed at night and put my head on the pillow, whether I feel no regret at not having done something that I could have done, that's what I judge my actions on, and therefore I have to weigh in. That's great. I mean, that's that's really this this issue of integrity, having having intellectual integrity, having integrity in one's life. So, when did this issue of free speech? Because I assume, because I I remember a time where I never thought about free speech. I just took it for granted, and and partially. Now in Israel, I have to say. You know, there were some limitations on my free speech, and one day I'll tell the story. But when I came to the U.S., part of my assumption was, yay, I'm in the land of freedom. I can say whatever. When did it occur to you that there was an issue here that, yeah, you could, I mean, we, you could call somebody out on BS, but there were actually now penalties to be paid for doing that? So I think I saw it in different spheres. So in my academic career, as someone who, and I guess we'll talk about this later, someone who you know, founded and developed the field of evolutionary consumption, yeah. the application of evolutionary psychology to consumer behavior. Uh, I saw it there because most of the colleagues, not my natural sciences colleagues, but my social sciences colleagues, were, what is this idiot saying, this whole biology stuff? This is insane. What is he talking about sex differences? And so there was already there a sense that I was speaking something very heretical. Uh, I would get papers desk rejected where the, the editor would write back to me, and it would literally be as though I am communicating with an utter moron, right? Where he <laughs> simply, did, he or she did not yeah. recognize what does this biology have to do? Biology is relevant for the zebra and the mosquito. What are you talking about? We're consumers. We transcend that, right? So there's, so. But to some extent, that's part of academia, isn't it? I mean, don't you see that in really anybody who's pushing the envelope, who's doing new work? I mean, I remember in finance, you know, the people who started doing um, 
uh, behavioral, behavioral finance, uh, which, which I, you know, I, I agree with somewhat and, and disagree with other things, but, but they were doing new work and it was new and it was, nobody would take them seriously for years. And then, of course, now everybody takes them seriously and now they, they dominate the field. So Thaler yeah. and people like that. So, well, Thaler uh, was my professor, by the way. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. I, okay. Uh, so, so no I'm, connections, I'm yeah. Much, yeah, I'm very much steeped in that tradition. Yep. Uh, and so, so I first sort of saw it professionally in my academic career. Sure. But then as I would go out into the world and interact with people, oftentimes with academics, it struck me how uh, constrained people were to just have open conversations, even in contexts where it wasn't public, right? We're, we're just chatting at a party. Everybody weighed you know, their every word, whereas I'm someone who, who's very irreverent. I just speak my mind, yeah. right? And, and yeah. okay. So then that's the second place I saw it. And then, of course, in the greater society, when I started seeing all the identity politics and so on everywhere, I just I couldn't take it. I was like a pressure cooker. And in a sense, Twitter, because oftentimes people say, well, oh, when you interact on Twitter, you seem oftentimes to be a bit more sarcastic. Well, it's because in a sense, Twitter is my means of letting out the steam from the <laughs> pressure cooker. Right. When yeah. I'm having this kind of conversation with you now. I have a different communication style than I'm, one go I'm going after some idiot on Twitter. So Twitter, in a sense, is my personal therapy. It allows <laughs> me to deal with the craziness of the world. Yeah. I, I mean, I, mean I, I can see that. I'm I'm tempted on Twitter. I, I, I sometimes hold back. Sometimes I don't. But I can see because in hundred part of it's the cleverness of putting it into 144 characters and no longer kind of a real dig at, you know, getting at somebody and, and just... I used to tweet the uh, State of the Union addresses, which was a lot of fun because I, I, I had something to say about every sentence. That, and plug in the president. It doesn't really matter. I have something negative to say about almost everything they say. So it, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I noticed the free speech issue, I guess, really after 9-11. And I noticed it really on, uh, on two sides of it. There was a sudden rise of patriotism where you couldn't criticize Bush and there was a sudden pushback against anybody who criticized Bush. And I was very critical of Bush on his right, if you will. I thought he was a wimp. So I, right. I, thought, I thought to deal with the threat that we really faced, you need to be a lot tougher and you need to be. And, and people say, no, you can't do that. You can't criticize Bush. And, and then, so that was kind of from the right. And then from the left, oh, my God. I mean, people would yell me down and demonstrate and, and attack. And I was, I don't know if you're Daniel Pipes, but I was often with Daniel Pipes. Right doing events after 9-11, and it was just, it was just mayhem. Um, I noticed that them, I think before that, I really did take it for granted. It, acknowledging the academic side, I think that's always existed. I think if you're right. pushing the envelope in academia, even on a, whether, whether what you're doing is right or wrong, I mean, put, put that aside, just pushing the envelope and challenging yeah. the authorities to be. It's part of the tenure system. They, they reinforce themselves. Right. Um, it's 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 always there, but on the culture, it was nine eleven really struck me as as this real change in the culture. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I probably agree with that because uh, you know there are different consequences to trying to restrict someone's open and honest dialogue about an issue, yeah. and I suppose there is no greater you know important issue on a civilizational you know scale than whether and how we handle the issue of whether you know Islamic doctrines are uh, you know are consistent with our secular liberal democracies and so on, and so in that sense I agree with you. Uh, what amazes me is the extent to which, and I've, I've weighed in on this uh, in, in in other venues, the extent to which my academic colleagues refuse to even engage in a discussion on this topic, even in context where no one could know that they're taking these positions. So even if I want to have a private conversation with someone at a conference sitting at a bar, the amount of you know hedging that they engage is, and it shows you, I mean, if you are this afraid, given the current demographic realities, do you want me to predict what's going to happen <laughs> to your fear when it's 10 times where we are today? So, so I think I agree with you that where the, the, the sort of the issue went on steroids is precisely when Islam became so central to our daily lives. Why do you think that is? What is it? That, because it, it's absolutely that you, you cannot. It's as if they've got a battle going on in their own minds. I'm not supposed to think this. I'm not supposed to say this. I'm not even supposed to hear this. And so you can't even have that conversation one-on-one -on -one with people because they're so afraid of the consequences, I guess. 
So I think it's two, it's twofold. Uh, let's talk about sort of the more banal one. Uh, well, banal, but even more consequential. Yeah. People are are literally physically afraid. Yes. They're afraid. Yes. I mean, right? I always tell people who think that all religions are equal. I say, why don't I set up three different websites for you under your name? And one will be critical of Jainism, one will be critical of Jehovah's Witness, one will be critical of Islam, and we will post your uh, personal address, and then let's test your idea. That's yep. a very easy way to empirically test uh, your position. And then, of course, they kind of shut their mouths, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think a second reason that's maybe a bit more difficult to actually penetrate is the fact that people have been parasitized by this notion that it is uniquely gauche and inappropriate to criticize Islam because you know it is a, a religion of the brown person. It is the religion of the downtrodden. Yes. Even though in most places where Islam rules, it's by far the majority. In most of the cultures, it's 98, 99, 100%. So they're hardly the minority in terms of the places where Islam rules. They really rule. But they're but still downtrodden something. in the sense of they're still poor. In, in, they're, in, they're, they're poor, they're refugees, yes. they're noble, they're they're yes. exotic, right? Yep. And so so to criticize Christianity is extraordinarily progressive. Yes. And if I want to be part of the academic uh, ivory tower, to criticize some idiotic notion in Christianity makes me progressive. If I criticize something as idiotic, if not more so in Islam, well, that's just racist and bigoted. And so until we're able to convince people that there is nothing unique about Islam in your capability to 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 attack it, to critique it, to ridicule it, to mock it, uh, then we're going to have this problem. Well, I was at I was giving a talk at Oxford, and this one professor tried to convince me that while while it was okay to criticize the West for slavery, it was wrong to criticize other cultures for slavery. That is, you being a Westerner can only comment on your own culture. And it, you, you have to just leave other cultures alone. And it, it, it was a woman. And I said, so, so you're okay with the way women are treated in Saudi Arabia? And she said, I wouldn't be okay with it if I were treated like this here, but I can't comment on, I, I can't have a position because this multiculturalism, it's so insidious. It, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, look, uh, my, my next book uh, will deal with what I call idea pathogens, right? So I, I, I analogize uh, biological pathogens that parasitize brains. So, you know, the, the classic example I give, but there are many of these that I'll be covering in the book. Uh, there's a the mice can be infected with a particular uh, parasite that causes it to lose its innate fear of cats, right? Well, that's not a very good thing to not be afraid of cats when yep. you are a mouse, yep. right? Uh, there is a type of, uh, there are ungulates, so elk, mo moose, deer, that when they become parasitized by a particular brain worm, they start engaging in what's called circling behavior. They go around and circle, and uh -huh. they cannot extricate themselves. So if the, if the predators are coming, they will still go around. Wow. So I argue that in the same way that there is this class of biological pathogens, human beings can also be parasitized by idea pathogens wow. that, that will lead us down the path you know, towards the abyss of infinite lunacy. So multiculturalism, identity politics, cultural relativism, postmodernism, radical feminism, all of these each of them might not be sufficient to, uh, you know, make you collapse your edifice of reason, but put together, it becomes a tsunami of nonsense that's difficult to defeat. Yeah, and I, I think that's fascinating because all ideas, I mean, all bad ideas are going to generate that. It's just a question of how many and, and to what extent. But, and, and I think, and this relates, we'll talk about this more, I think, I think reason is an achievement, right? So the default is all the crap. The default right. is, is, is religion and mysticism of all, because I consider many of these ideologies mystical because they, they're not rooted in reality. They're not rooted in fact. So the default is mysticism and, 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 and this, and, and reason is an achievement. And if you let go of reason in any one of these ways, disaster follows, whether it's exactly. civilizational disaster or individual disaster, it's disaster follows. So what, what you're basically saying is that it's easy for human minds to be parasitized by idiotic viruses, and you're exactly right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it takes great effort to actually not be parasitized, to be inoculated from these uh, pathogens. You're right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, you know, Rand viewed that effort as the essence of what free will is. That right. effort to engage your reason is the, the essence of what free will is. It's to turn it on or to turn it off. 
to engage in the effort or not. I was going to say, be careful, never say free will with Sam Harris. You'll get very upset. Oh, no, no. I, I, you know, I know. I, every one of these members of the intellectual dark web, I have a whole list of things that I disagree with each one of them. And it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. It, it makes for lively conversations. Uh, it does. It does. Although, although many, of them, many of them are avoiding me. So <laughs> I, I actually just that. was invited uh, two weeks ago. I was speaking at the Association for Psychological Science Conference in San Francisco. And uh, I was delighted to be invited by, I guess, the gentleman who coined the term, Eric uh, Weinstein. Oh, yes, yes. That's so he great. invited me. And he was, uh, maybe he doesn't want me to say this, but we were speaking on the phone. He said, I just want to let you know that it wasn't me who did not include you in that list of intellectuals. <laughs> and, and that, I think it's because, I mean, he was being very gracious because yep. at one point I was trolling the New York Times uh, author who had, and I, it's, people literally thought, you know, I'm sitting in my bedroom in a fetal position, sucking my thumb, crying. <laughs> Why? Why did I was trolling her? I was having fun. I he had a smile fun. on my yeah. face. Uh, I said, "Don't worry about it, Eric. I'll, I'll, I'll learn to love again. It's okay." Yeah, I, I think I'll always be on the margins, but I think you are deeply embedded in the intellectual dark <laughs> web. So, uh, <laughs> I think it'll be a while before anybody embraces me inside, except Dave. Dave seems right. to be the connector. And, and the person who links oh. us all together, which is wonderful. I mean, it's just, I, I love the guy. He's, I he's actually, fabulous. He's fantastic. I yeah. actually saw a, a thing somewhere, I don't know where, that had done exactly what you said, sort of had done a, a, a sort of a, yep. a, a first level sociometric analysis. And I think uh, Dave was the In top the connector of yep. all the, exactly. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean Islam really functions as as one of these, uh, but it's it, it, but it, you know I've always viewed that the the civilizational issue, and I wonder what you think of this, is not Islam, because I think it's pretty pathetic. Um, it's us, right? It's our inability to define and defend Western values, what it is to mean Western values. If we actually had that conception. They would be a little, they would be a pest, a little pest that we could get rid of. It, it's not, you know, they don't really have the weapons or in, the intellectual firepower, any kind of firepower to threaten us. It's our weakness. A hundred percent. That allows Look, us, I, I mean. You, you probably uh, know this quote. Uh, it, it really, it, in, in several versions, it comes from several Islamic leaders and thinkers uh, who have said the following. So I'll kind of paraphrase it. Uh, we will not conquer the West militarily. We will conquer the West in three ways. Through the womb of our women, uh, through hijra, uh, immigration, that's the Arabic word, sure. and through by using your miserable freedoms against you. Yep. They say it loudly. They get yep. on top of the mountain and give you the exact playbook. And you're exactly right that uh, it is it is the weakness of uh, the the self confidence in your own values that allows this playbook to to play out, right? And I've often said that I despise the Western weakness yep. a lot more than I do Absolutely. the Islamists, because at least the Islamists are fighting for a cause. You may not like their cause, yep. but at least they've got the uh, they they act out their convictions, and you have to respect them for that in some you know diluted way. Uh, but the Western castrated coward, he's the worst of the worst. I, I agree completely. And, and even those three, so I think they actually hurt their cause when they engage in violence because it's that violence that wakes up the Westerner at least for five minutes to, to defend himself. But those three, all three would be combated easily by the West saying, if you, by the West assimilating them. And I think we, we have a, a powerful philosophy, a powerful ideology that would assimilate them. So it turns out that in America, the Muslims have fewer kids, that when they're better assimilated, they have fewer kids, they, they uh, you know, they, all the three kind of drop away because they become American or they become Canadian or they become whatever. It's because we don't demand assimilation, because we don't know what to assimilate into. Like you ask a European, what is Europe? They don't know. They have no idea. What are Western values? Maybe they think Christianity, but that's their downfall if they think the West is Christianity. Um, it, it really is the whole Islamic agenda falls apart yeah. if, if once the West stands on its two feet. But the problem is that the person who is fully assimilated, it takes a very small committed interaction with the holy books to again 
you know, be revert to being problematic, right? Maybe. So, so, so the question, my question, and, and of course, you don't know who will succumb to that sure, pull and sure, who won't. Sure. Uh, my, my thinking is very simple. Any ideology, it doesn't matter which one, doesn't have to be only Islam, that is incongruent with our foundational values, I don't need to tolerate it. No one needs to tolerate it. So if you wish to come into our cultures and abide by our foundational values without us ceding a single millimeter on any of those values, welcome in my brother, let's live together in peace. Yep. If you don't, then there are many, many other cultures, many other places where you can exercise your right to your religion. But your religion never supersedes the right of a third party. It's, it's really not that difficult. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and again, I think if, if Western cultures committed themselves to separation of church and state, committing themselves to a female genital mutilation as a crime, and we will prosecute that crime, committed themselves to actually following the rule of law, then you get that. Then, then if they, they yeah. come and they don't belong, they leave, but you don't, you never surrender one iota to them. Exactly. My challenge is that some people would argue we should have a ideological test before they come in to the country. And that worries me to no end because giving the government the power to decide on ideology scares the bejesus out of me. So I, I would rather government never thinks about ideology. We culturally enforce it. And, and and frankly, how difficult would it be for someone who is committed to cause, let's put it charitably, mischief to beat any ideological test, right? I mean, yep, it doesn't exactly, take exactly. a evil genius to beat. Uh, what do you think of female genital mutilation? Oh, oh I abhor it. Abhor it. What yeah. do you think of Jews? I love them. Yes. What do you think of gays? They're my closest friends. Geez, that took a lot of difficulty for me to beat the, the ideological test, right? So this is why I think all this vetting stuff is complete nonsense. I mean, yes, there is vetting that you make sure that somebody was not an active sure, member sure. of a terrorist group, but to really vet your heart and mind, bullshit. No, I agree. I agree. And, and, and you know, I've been arguing since 9-11, I don't know your position on this, but I've been arguing since 9-11 that all they need, all, one, all the West really needs to do is crush them. It's really defeat them. Uh, make it clear to them they cannot win. Psychologically, it's very difficult to become a passionate suicide bomber for a cause that you know is lost. Mm. So if we made it clear to them that their cause was lost, that they had no hope of ever achieving it, I, I think the, the, the appetite for the radicalization, for the, for, the, for the suicide bombing would decline dramatically, and more and more of them would want to go with a winner, which is the West. So let me give you a quick anecdote uh, that comes from uh, a saying that the Taliban members uh, use. So they say apparently that the Americans have all the watches, but we have all the time in the world, yep. right? Inshallah, right? Yep. So, so, so to speak to your point, I think that the, the temporal view of those who are committed to having ultimate peace around the world where we all will be under the flag <laughs> of Islam. Yep. So you see, Islam is a religion of peace. It seeks peace. Oh, absolutely. We are all under the flag of Islam. How could you say that that's not peaceful, right? Yep. And so so I think the, the, the issue is that the Western mindset is very different in terms of its temporal orientation from uh, sort of the Islamic one, or at least the, the expansionist Islamic one. And again, I hate to preface this, most uh, yeah, Muslims yeah. don't yeah. think like this and are lovely and are kind and I want so, my children. So my issue is that the guy sitting on the fence trying to decide, am I gonna go the Islamist route or am I gonna go just be a normal human being? I think he's swayed to go one direction or the other by where he sees more confidence where he sees more interest and where he sees victory. So when ISIS was gaining territory, lots of recruits, because they were winning. But if, if ISIS is crushed on day one, if, if the Saudi theocracy is eliminated, if, if, if the theocrats around the world are destroyed, you know, um, it turns out that uh, November 4th, 1979, uh, the, the, the taking of the embassy uh, by Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran was a key moment in Islamist history because it emboldened even Sunnis that said, oh, wow, if we can do it in Iran, if you can get rid of the Shah, or Iran, a relatively secular, westernized country, then we could do it anyway. And they went to all these other countries, and, and really the modern Islamist movement was started then, Sunni and Shiite. And if, 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 you, if you destroy those models for them, then I think 
yeah, there are always going to be a few, always, right? Right. But the the passion, the growth, the 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 excitement, the energy around it, I think dissipates. Let let let's hope that you're right. Well, it'll never. Nobody will ever do what I tell what I what I what I argue for. So we'll never we'll never actually test that theory. So we will right. see. I I I know that you know uh, Tommy Tommy Robinson. So I just want to ask you. Um, I don't know him. I, I I've read a little bit about him, and obviously he's in jail now because of this. So I just wanted your view because you've you've met him and sure, sure. and uh, about what he's like and and what your evaluation is of what's happened to him. Yeah. So. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to speak to him, uh, one of many reasons, was precisely to attack the notion, uh, the kind of grotesque notion, even coming from you know otherwise sophisticated people, that my God, how could you talk to this neo-Nazi bigot, uh, right-wing extremist? Now, in all of the positions that I had seen him, I mean, yeah, sometimes he's he's you know he he, he uses discourse that 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 I would not use, but I had never seen truly. You know, outlandish hate from him, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to offer him certainly my platform was to hopefully show the world that he's actually quite a measured guy. And you can't imagine the number of people who have subsequently written to me and who've told me I gen I feel ashamed that I actually had bought. Uh, fully the idea that he is basically Hitler and then after yeah. seeing him on your show he came across as a very reasonable guy that had no no hatred in his heart but that felt that his society should should be protected and so my interactions with him have been nothing but uh, wonderful I've never seen any sense even when we spoke offline not just you know in the taped conversations I never saw any hatred from him uh, now, when it comes to what's happened to him, I think it's it's grotesque. I even I, I did a sad truth clip on it recently. I mean, it, it's amazing how many people wrote to me angrily saying, you know, sad, you're such a moron. Do you not realize that he broke the law and he was warned not to do this? But then the question is, why does such a law exist in the first place? Why is it that someone cannot be indignant and report about the industrial scale level rape of little children, right? I mean, if that is something that should not cause you indignation, um, now, then they, they would come back to me and say, but he is threatening the integrity of the case. These guys are going yeah. to, look, it's, it's all bullshit. We clearly know that people would love for him to just shut up and go away because they're, if nothing else, they're embarrassed at having been complicit in the wholesale rape of children via their apathy. And so I think it's grotesque it's and he will go down as an important historical figure. So, so yeah, I mean, I, the, the law, the law if practiced consistently, one could argue about whether a law like that should exist or not. I, I'm, I don't know, but it's clearly not practiced consistently. So, so the, you know, clearly he was, uh, you know, he was singled out for, for prosecution. It looks like, and it's, it's not that, if, you know, if you practice the law consistently and he knows the law, then he could have protected himself from it. You can still comment on the trial without being right there. But it's, it, it, it clearly they were out to get him. Um, yeah. And it's really and I've, disgusting. I've, I've spoken to him off, off record where he shared with me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I won't get all the details, sure, but, sure. Uh, you know, of when he goes into prison, let me tell you, if for no other reason, right, most of our colleagues, the academic types who 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 are who 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 navigate in cowardice, and then you see this guy who, again, whether you like him or not, whether you disagree with his positions or not, is putting his life on the line in such unbelievable ways. How could you not admire that? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree. It really is horrible. So I noticed um, on, on a different topic. I noticed sure. that. Um, you, you've been doing these videos on Carl Jung. Um, oh, hold on. Let me, <laughs> I'm just channeling the Jungian drum beats archetypes. Okay, P I'm ready. Please no, because up until, up until now I understood everything you said, and <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what motivated you? Is, is this part of this kind of BS detector? It is BS detector. I wouldn't have cared about him were it not for the fact. Now people say. Oh, you're doing this because despite the fact that you pretend you're friends with Jordan Peterson, you really hate him now because he's successful. So you're just jealous. Uh, That's right. It. <laughs> but and the reason which I stated in my first uh, thing was that I receive a lot of emails and requests 
to weigh in on Carl Young because he has been reinvigorated into the conversation yep. by Jordan, yep. right? Yep. And therefore, what I was doing there is after receiving the 13th trillion message asking me, hey, Dr. Saad, can you give us a sense of what you think of the astrologer of the human mind and grand bullshitter Carl Jung? This is, these are my yep. words. Yep. Uh, and so, so now I, I sort of gave a bit of a thing with, with this trilogy of Jungian uh, uh, clips that I did. But now people are upset. Why aren't you spending more time actually delving into dismantling each of his positions? And my general point was, for the same reasons that I'm not going to come up with a series as to why creationism is bullshit. And it's not because I'm running away from it. Look, has he said anything that makes sense? Of course. He even used, as an evolutionary psychologist, he used evolutionary ideas. Some of them are wrong, but he certainly had some very nice insights about how evolutionary theory might be relevant in shaping archetypes. Sure. But is a lot of the stuff that he's written and said complete mystical occultism, new age, utter non-scientific bullshit, 100%. And I'm not going to waste my time re-prosecuting a case when psychologists have left young 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And and so what do you think Jordan is doing? I mean, is he is he finding the better stuff there or, or is he bought into some of the BS? I, I think it's, it's a bit of both. A bit of both, I yeah. think that the, I think that uh, Jordan's message. Uh, look, when when I sit down with Jordan on on my shows or in other times when we sure, met and so sure. on, and we're doing sort of just hardcore science stuff, it's fantastic. But his greater message, where you know he's he's also a self help guru and so on, it, in a sense, it is more powerful if it includes elements of the Jungian stuff and the quasi-religious stuff and that, right? You become a yeah. lot more of an apostle and a true guru of how to lead one's life if you incorporate some of that mystical bullshit. So I don't know if he does it willfully or whether he's done it because it ultimately uh, taps into some of his greater goals. Uh, but in a sense, I'm quite disappointed in it. And as I explained in my clip that I recently released where I said, look, Jordan and I could be great allies on 95% of things, but I could disagree with him on some things. And that's not because I hate him or I'm jealous of him. That's because I wouldn't have the intellectual integrity that people know me for if I suddenly say, oh, but when it comes to Jordan, if he ever says anything that I consider bullshit, I'll keep my mouth shut. That makes no sense. Yeah, no, and I think, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, people are so afraid of you know, intellectuals criticizing one another. I mean, but that's what we do, right? I mean, part of what we do is we debate ideas, we discuss ideas. And as long as it doesn't become personal, as long as what we're talking about is in the realm of ideas, this is what we do. And to stay silent when somebody else is saying something that you think is bullshit is wrong. It's right. just, it's, it's not honest. And, 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 and look, he, he, I'll give you one or two examples of other things, uh, which I'm not sure if I've weighed in on this publicly or yeah. not. So, you know, Jordan, argues about, you know, how could you have morality without this Judeo-Christian yeah, foundation? Yeah, we would yeah. each be these selfish, psychopathic agents. Well, we can talk about selfish. I mean, right, we can talk right, about the yeah, use true. of that word. <laughs> right, right, yeah. true. And, and so when I, when, I, when I see something like this, I mean, it really holds me back. Yeah. It, to me, yeah. that statement would be like me saying on a, on a public forum, Everybody knows that the earth is flat. Yep. There is no proof that yep. the earth is not flat. And so that position that there is no clear, unequivocal, unassailable scientific basis of morality is so outlandish that it borders on saying that the earth is flat. So when I now criticize that position of Jordan, it's not I hate Jordan. I love Jordan. Yep. Jordan is a yep. lovely guy. Yep. Yep. Uh, he's, he's a friend. I would love to have him over for dinner. But do I think that that particular statement is false? Yes. Yeah, and, I, and we, we'll, we agree on that completely. Uh, we might come out with a different uh, outcome of what morality is, but we agree that, I mean, it's ridiculous, to, and, but it's a commonly held belief. I mean, Jordan is not unusual here. Jordan is the mainstream. I think, yeah. I think we're the ones who are unusual. You know, Sam Harris says we can bridge the is art gap. I believe we can, I, you know, I, I believe we can bridge the is art gap that's, that science does lead to morality you can you can find more you know you can find your moral values and virtues from a scientific analysis of human nature um and and of reality but uh, but the common view 
you know, are reflected by Jordan and Prego and Ben Shapiro, but, but really by everybody out there, is that, no, you need some external something un- yeah. that is not understandable to give you morality. Otherwise, you become a murderous. Otherwise, you become an animal with well, no I, capacity I, I, to reason and control yourself. I, I always say that, you know, were it not for the Torah, I would right now be looking to decapitate puppies and rape their their headless bodies. It is only through reading uh, Deuteronomy and the other the, the five books of Moses that I refrain from raping dead puppies. Right? Uh, I mean, it is so laughable that. And, and by the way, the reason why I, I feel a tension in in criticizing uh, Jordan because on the one hand he is a friend, you know, absolutely. But on the other hand. As he is becoming bigger, yep. uh, then my commitment to truth supersedes my affection for, you. for our friendship, right? Yep. And yep. so I'm torn, right? Because yep. I'm because I don't want to be attacking him in the same frontal, no nonsense way that I sometimes can. And so I'm torn, right? Because I do think that there are so many things on which him and I are such sympathetic allies, freedom of speech and sure, all that, right? Sure. But for example, when it comes to postmodernism and his attacks on postmodernism and my attacks on postmodernism, that's great. But then if I ask you, so do you believe in God? And your answer is, what do you mean by do I? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by believe in God? Then I'm taken back. So are you now satirizing postmodernists or have you become the king of postmodernists, right? So this is why I'm a bit conflicted regarding yeah. uh, Jordan yeah. is because I think in the grand scheme of scales, it's fantastic what's happened with him. And I only wish him the best, but I'd like for him to cut down a bit on the bullshit. But I, I think you get the Torah all wrong because my reading of the Torah, they actually teach you how to decapitate puppies. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, mean sure. I, I remember those passages. Uh, for those of you who say we only criticize Islam, look, we're criticizing now the oh holy my... books of Judaism, and we think they're also bullshit, you see? I do it all the time, so people are used to it for me. But, you know, yes, I mean, uh, there's no free speech in, in Judaism. When uh, Moses comes down, down from the mountain with the, with the Ten Commandments and some of the Jews are worshipping a golden calf, he doesn't calmly put them down, go over and say... You know, you have your freedom of religion. Go do your thing. Just leave us alone. He drops them because he's so angry. He picks up a sword with his, with his brother and slaughters, I think it's 30,000 people that day. And, that God, and God rewards him, right? And he gets a reward from God for doing that because he stood up for the true religion. So don't give me this religion of peace about Judaism or about Christianity. None of them are religions of peace. Faith does not go well with peace. Yeah, exactly right. Because well because said. it's only reason, it's only reason, it's only a capacity to argue and debate and use reality as the standard of truth that allows for peace. Because then the truth, we, we can discuss it. But once it's my faith versus your faith. Yeah. Well, and earlier you were talking about, you know, any idea should be debated. I mean, what's the peer review process, right? I mean, <laughs> I spend years working on some project, right? Years to come up with the, 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 the topic and then collect the data and then sure. write the paper. And then you send it off to a journal. And let me summarize it for you. Your shit, your shit, your shit, your shit, go away. We're rejecting it, right? Yep. I don't go on a jihad. That's, <laughs> I, ex, I expect that for my paper to eventually be published, it has to pass the highest level of scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. So why am I subjected to that lens, but Islam or Judaism or Jungian bullshit is not, right? Absolutely. Everything is fair game. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, no, I, I, and I think, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, to me, the biggest danger with what, with what uh, Jordan is doing is his connection of morality with religion and, and the idea that morality cannot exist outside of religion um i think that's a very very dangerous trend because it means it means in spite of his interpretation of abraham which is complete bullshit um it means morality is authoritarian right that's yeah. the, that's the essence of the story of abraham you kill your son because i told you to yeah right morality is whatever i tell you to right if right. you know not that i'm god but if i was um, and it's very religious morality. It's always authoritarian morality. Well, I think it shows, by the way, that even sophisticated thinkers, and I don't mean to be patronizing, but no, no, he is truthful, a sophisticated thinker. Uh, 
he is a sophisticated thinker who's yep. got great depth and, yep. and you know I know it better than most uh, can still be prone to being parasitized by uh, idea pathogens right so in his case his particular blind spot and perhaps we all have blind spots uh, some will argue that my blind spot is that I love animals but yet I eat burgers that's my <laughs> behavioral blind spot perhaps but uh, his blind spot is I think that given his own religious bent he has constructed you know, uh, an epistemology uh, that is quite yes. puzzling to most of us who otherwise respect him for his intellect in other domains. Well, and, it, and it's an outcome of his metaphysics because his metaphysics, that's where he goes, he gets it wrong. His metaphysics is, to some extent, a kind of primacy of consciousness metaphysics. Reality exists because we think of it. Right. And it's, it's not realities independent of our own consciousness and, and our consciousness job if you will, is to identify what, to what is out there. It's to, it's to identify it and then in, integrate it and, and reason, you, use it for, for, for thinking. Um, so I think he goes wrong in metaphysics and then that, that kind of takes him, takes him away. But that's religion. That's religion. You know, that's religion. Yeah. It's, it's a tough one. Oh, wait, let's, let's jump into... Uh, to, and I don't know how much time, if you have time constraints. So. As much time as you need okay, or great. you want <laughs> until you get tired of speaking to me. Oh, that could be a Which long time. Which basically means it's ad infinitum because yeah, to yeah. get tired of speaking to me is an impossibility. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The only part I might get tired of is listening because I like to talk. So that's ah, the only well, challenge. <laughs> okay, I'll try to keep more quiet. No, 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 no. You're doing great. <laughs> I did not mean that. Um, I, I meant the part of me liking to talk, not the part of uh, listening. <laughs> so, so let me let me let me uh, uh, posit something and, and tell me if if you agree or disagree or how this fits in. I mean, it strikes me, and, and I'm a, I believe in free will. I think you do from, from what I've heard. I know Sam doesn't, but I think you do. So my view is that, that we are, we're, that every one of us, there's a component, evolutionary component, there's a genetic component that, that uh, has a say in who and what we are. There's clearly environmental component. There's, there's influences. And then there's the choices we have made along the way to engage with, our minds are not to engage, to be lazy, or to use our reason. And that, to me, that is the most important component, and that, in a sense, can override the others. In, in that's what makes us human: our ability to override them. Does that is, is that make sense? Does that is that the way you think about the world? So, so let me step. Let, let me take out the free will conversation from the, the okay. discussion for a bit. Uh, so, one of the there are many points on which the tractors of evolutionary psychology will like to focus on, each of which are perfectly incorrect. Uh, some of them are scientifically based, but most of them are ideologically based. In other words, most of the people who hate something about evolutionary psychology, it's because it attacks their essential pet ideology of theirs. Sure. So if I am religious, I hate evolutionary psychology because where is God in your thing? If I'm a postmodernist, I hate evolutionary psychology because there are no human universals. If I'm a radical feminist, I hate evolutionary psychology because it's not true that there are evolved sex differences and so on and so forth, yep. okay? Uh, so one of the things that people argue regarding evolutionary psychology is they say, oh, but it is a form of, well, it is not a form, it is the form of biological determinism. If you provide a biological evolutionary genetic explanation for a phenomenon then this argues that we are slave to simply execute that algorithm and of course that is profoundly idiotic because for most things not all but for most things as you correctly said we are an interaction of our genes and our unique environments even genes themselves get turned on or off depending on environmental inputs so the correct position that all evolutionists take is the interactionist position. So to argue that something is biological based doesn't remove the influence of the environment. So anybody who tells you that evolutionary psychology is biologically deterministic is simply advertising, I'm a moron who doesn't understand anything. That's all he's saying, okay? okay. So so on that, on that issue, it's clear. The, the issue of free will, I'm kind of uh, puzzled by it and I should mention, I haven't done enough reading on all of the different, uh, you know, uh, schools of thoughts on sure, free will. Sure. But if I were to summarize, given my very limited reading and exposure to sort of the free will debate, uh, Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne, both of whom have been on my show and are good friends, sure. basically argue, look, we are nothing more than basic natural laws. And if you unfold 
all of the cascading you know physical reactions that are all materialist then we arrive at the point that we're at and that's it it could be nothing else that seems profoundly uh, unimpressive to me yep. here's another one that they usually say uh, the brain will oftentimes have there's a delay between yeah. when you recognize that you're going to do something and the neuronal signature that again doesn't suggest that you don't have free will no. it literally just means that there is a neuronal lag between you being aware of it and your brain actually manifest manifesting that neural activation pattern so to me maybe because i'm not into all of this uh sort of mental masturbation i see it as a profoundly useless debate because if free will is something that doesn't exist then I'm really wasting my time trying to yep. study psychology of decision making yep. because what is is let's all go and have a beer right uh, so I might be missing something and I'm sure there will be tons of messages at the bottom of this sure, comment sure. saying I thought that God said what's smart but my <laughs> god what a moron he doesn't stuff here to me uh, uh, of course we are bound by physical laws but ultimately, when I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to marry person A or B or buy Coke or Pepsi, I, I don't understand where the free will conversation comes in. Maybe you can enlighten me. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an ancient conversation. It goes back to Greek philosophers, and it's, it's being debated to know. And I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going to try to, 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 to get that. But, uh, you know, the, even with the, with the neurological issue, right? So what example do they use? Raising your hand. And, I, and I'm quite willing to accept that whether I raise my hand at every given point in time is determined by lots of other things that come beforehand. So where do you put the essence of what free will is, the, the engagement of free will? I, so I start by the fact that, first of all, I know I have free will because I know I have free will. I can, I can tell that I'm making choices. Something is, is making a choice, and by very word that we use, choices, decisions, that means that there are options. What's they that? they sure. will respond to that. Forgive me for interrupting sure. you. They will respond that it's an uh, illusion. You've, it's exactly you evolved illusion. the illusion because it makes sense for you but, to be deluded in that way via that free will illusion. That is the same argument the postmodernists give to me when I say this is a pen. It's an absolutely unequivocal. I can see it, and I can touch yeah. it. Well, to me, introspection is like seeing and touching just about you, about your own nature. You cannot. The reason doesn't mean anything. If, if, if it's not some, it, if it's not, if there's no free will. It's just, a, it's just a, 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 a straightforward physical, biological process that we engage in. All the decisions have already been predetermined in a sense. And even if you have the, the, the environmental component, well, that's again just deterministic and it's all just deterministic. It's, it's one big, to me, they, what, so, so Rand's view is that, that the essence of free will is this idea of engaging your mind or disengaging it. Focus, like you get up in the morning and you kind of dozed off, you know, you're half asleep. And you, you actually make an effort. Okay, I'm going to focus now. Or you sit down to write a paper, right? You sit down to, to write the research. And you say, okay, I'm really going to focus now. That focus is what is the essence of free will. In a sense, everything flows from that. Now, can I explain it biologically? Can I explain it physically in terms of, no. But there are lots of things I can't explain in science you can't yet explain physically or biologically. But I can see it, right, in a sense. I can see it in myself. Now, yes, you can say it's an illusion, but then we might all be just in a vat, right? And this could all be a dream. That's the same argument. It's a silly argument. You, you, we have to rely on our senses. We have to rely on, on, on our own observations about the world. But how, how and, and again, maybe someone's already proposed yep. this argument, so please hold your hate mail. Uh, I'm a novice on this debate, if only because it profoundly, I found it profoundly uh, unsatisfying as a, as a as a point of discussion. Sure. I don't mean that you bring it up, yeah. but just as a as sure. something that I'm going, I'm willing to spend two, you know, I agree. reading two thousand years. Right? But let, let's, what if I were a machine uh, uh, that simply does? So actually, I'm called the GAD machine. Yeah. So that if if you present me with two women, the the manifest preference that I would choose is woman A. In other words, if all the cascade of all of the uh, physical laws that would result in me instantiating my preference to woman A, I now create a not GAD machine. So whatever I was going to manifest as my choice, I now choose the opposite of that. Yep. 
right? So what would so then what would that be? Would that be that? Oh, but that's that's simply the cascade of neuronal. I mean, yeah, and it's and it. it and you see, it's you can't from the. It might be possible to create a machine that we from the outside cannot tell if it has free will or not. But we're not. We have experiences. We have a consciousness. We 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 experience life, right? Machines don't experience. Right. Not they don't. They're not conscious. Animals have experience, and maybe they have some free will. It's hard to tell if they make choices or not. But we through introspection, can tell that we're making choices. So I, so I, I agree with you. It, it, it matters because there's no morality if, the, if we're all deterministic. Nothing matters if we're all deterministic. Right. It's, what's the point of studying things if we're all deterministic? We, you know, go to the beach, and I, I don't even know what that matters. If, if but, but then, so let me ask you this. Uh, so what, what is the main reason? Maybe this is, a, uh, maybe it's, this is too difficult of a question. Yeah. What is the fundamental intellectual reason for this debate so for example you might say oh. well for some people they want to argue that there is no free will because that serves to excuse people's actions and they want to be softer on crime i'm making this up i don't know yeah. so what what is the intellectual pull of this conversation that i'm missing well the intellectual pull is in philosophy certainly moral agency right okay. are you responsible i think that's the fundamental i think for somebody like sam and I'm speculating here, and I, you know, I, I'm sure he'll contradict me, but it's, he wants to be a scientist. He wants everything to be grounded in science, and he views free will as mystical somehow. It's, a, it's, it's this little spark of God. And the right. truth is that in the past, most defenders of free will have defended it on mystical grounds. And so when he, so he, I think he's thrown out the baby with the bathwater, when he rejects religion and he's rejected everything mystical, and I'm all for that, I'm rejecting for everything mystical, but I don't think free will has to be viewed as mystical. It might be something we still don't understand. There's a lot of phenomena in the natural world we still don't understand, but it's a natural phenomena that we can all observe just as we observe any other scientific phenomena. And I think that's what you're saying is, look, I deal with free will all day. I don't call it that because I deal with choices, but if, without choices, this is all just mechanistic. It would be uninteresting if I was just analyzing the decision making of robots, because so all, all he, I'd look is okay. the algorithm. Yeah, go ahead. So what would he say? And again, I'm asking yeah. you to put yourself in his. Yeah. And it's only because you probably are much more familiar with this yeah. debate than I am. So when I wake up every day and try to understand the evolutionary roots of human behavior, what would Sam say? about that exercise is it still worthwhile because notwithstanding the fact that we don't have free will at least it allows me to predict behavior better would that be his position he would say and again <laughs> this is me trying to channel sam Adams, sure. which is very hard because he's brilliant and you know and i mean he's he's, he's a f phenomenal mind but my guess is what he's saying is the more knowledge we have the more inputs into our computers the better decisions, the better outcomes we will have. So while I'm not choosing, but the more exposed I am to truth, the more information the computer has, the better the outcome coming out of it. I, I think that's how he'd explain it. I'm not um, moved, but okay, thanks for okay. the explanation. So, so, uh, so let me try this on you. Um, again, from an epistemological perspective, uh, you know, trying to understand what it is exactly that's coded in terms of evolutionary psychology, what it is that's coded in our genes. So I, I'm just going to divide kind of uh, human experiences and, or human, I'm not sure exactly what the general title here. We've got certain inclinations, um, we've got emotions, and we've got ideas. Now to me, ideas are not something that can be encoded because epistemologically ideas come from our interaction with reality and we have to be alert and aware and a reasoning being in order to get ideas. But I can see inclinations being encoded. Does that make sense? So it depends you? how you define, I'm not being postmodern on no, you. No, but no, 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 it it, that does yeah. depend how you define it. Yeah. Everything depends exactly. on how you define it. <laughs> so let's take an example. Yeah. Uh, and then you tell me whether this is an idea or whether it's an inclination to use your nomenclature. Sure. So let's say uh, how we respond to beauty or how we specifically respond to beautiful faces. Yeah. So evolutionary psychologists argue that all other things considered, uh, a more symmetric face 
is across the world viewed as more beautiful than an asymmetric face uh, because of certain uh, signals that symmetry uh, exudes or or, or uh, embodies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now the question becomes: Well, is 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 that something that is learned, or is that something that is inscribed? And the way that you would test that in this case, uh, there are many ways to establish that something is part of our biological blueprint. One of the ways is through developmental psychology. You could take children who are not yet at the age whereby they could be socialized. By definition, they haven't reached that cognitive de developmental stage. You could show them photos of people's faces that vary on symmetry, and then you could simply watch how long they gaze at one, yep. or the first one that they gaze at, or the first one that they try to, uh, you know, touch. How right? young so could you do this with, with kids? You could, you could, around six months old. I wow. think the study that I'm thinking wow. of is, uh, wow. you know, maybe six to nine months old. Okay. Uh, similar thing you do, for example, with toy preferences, yeah. uh, because the social constructivists will argue that it's, it's the socialization of teaching little boys to play with blue yeah. trucks and teaching little girls to play with pink dolls that starts the cascade of gender role socialization. Well, you could take children who, again, are cognitively speaking too young. They're infants, six months old, nine months old, and you could show that they already exhibit those sex-specific preferences. So what, so what evolutionary psychology has is a very, very broad range of data that it can use to unequivocally demonstrate that something is... Uh, as part of our biological heritage, which, by the way, speaks to something that really annoys me uh, from the detractors of evolutionary psychology when they argue that evolutionary psychology is pseudoscience where you just come up with just so stories. It is the exact opposite of that that serious evolutionary psychologists do, because what to, to really build an adaptive argument, to argue that something is an adaptation, you have to build what... Uh, so I, I talk about this in one of my recent papers, nomological networks of cumulative evidence. What does that mean? You have to find data stemming from different cultures, different time periods, uh, uh, different paradigms, different methodologies, all of which point to the unassailable truth of that statement that you're making. Charles Darwin himself had done exactly that sure. in, in, in Origin of Species. Yeah. Now, he didn't call it nomological networks, but what did he do? Over a 30-year period, he collected tons of data from radically different sources. Once you put it together, you can't counter his natural selection argument. And so, uh, so to, to, to go back to your question, so, I, so is, the, is, is the innate preference for certain beauty markers an inclination or an idea? So I suspect it's an inclination that then we build ideas over. So, so, you know, so there are a number of things. So one is I've met a lot of women who, you know, wow, beautiful. And then after 10 minutes, they look like unbelievably ugly to me, right? Because, you know, like their personalities. Yes, because their personalities have come through and it changes how I look at their face, right? So, right. And, and so that, that to me is, yes, the inclination is there. But once I learn more about what beauty means to me today, is more than the symmetry because I've integrated that preference with a whole set of other ideas. And now when I see their personality, I can't even see the beauty anymore. It's gone. So they're not beautiful to me anymore. Um, of course, you know, artists know, and, and Michelangelo and, and uh, Da Vinci and all of those great artists all knew that there's certain symmetries, there's certain patterns, there's certain, you know, pyramids of shapes that human, the human being responds to positively in a way that they don't respond to other things. Certainly, to use a Jordan Peterson thing, we don't respond well to chaos, right? Uh, right. You know, unless you're a modern artist, and, and we can talk a lot about modern art, but, but, but in terms of real art, um, you know, the, we don't respond well to chaos. We respond to certain patterns, and, and, and I think that's, that's an inclination. I mean, I don't know the science you do, and, and it, sounds like, it sounds like there's, but I think we build on that. So we take an inclination, and then we build an abstract idea of beauty that's got a foundation in our inclinations that becomes the idea of beauty. Right. And so I guess maybe that also relates to more broadly the idea, for example, of a meme to a memeplex, right? A meme is the sort of smallest unit of, it could be an idea that spreads from brain to brain yep. using uh, something akin to, you know, the propagation of genes. The memeplex is the collection of ideas. So religion is a memeplex, whereas... Uh, 
a singular ad slogan would be just a meme, yeah. right? So I think that's what you're speaking of. You you have a set of biological inclinations on which we then build a, a bigger edifice of ideas. Yeah, Fair I enough. think epistemologically they're different because the one is in a sense somehow coded, ingrained, and the other we have to gain evidence from reality and apply reason. And I think the only way to do this is by application of reason, integrate, but, but the foundation is there with that inclination. So that inclination right. serves as the, as the, I don't know, a foundation on which you build a house, right? And, uh, and, and I would say, so just to, to build on what you're saying, so take, for example, something like the, the, uh, the innate, if I, people, some people don't like the term innate, yeah, but yeah. colloquially we understand what it means. Take the innate penchant for men to seek social status, right? So the, the universal is, if you like, the Darwinian rule is seek social status. Now, the manner by which you instantiate that will vary across individuals. And that, by the way, shows you that it's not deterministic, right? So yeah. you and I share a common desire to ascend the social hierarchy because that will get us greater access to women. But I may choose to do it by becoming a famous professor. You may choose to do it by being a great diplomat or a painter or a soccer player or whatever it is that you choose. So that's what then creates behavioral heterogeneity, right? Because a lot of people think, oh, but if something is a human universal, that implies that every single outcome will be exactly the same. We will all know. We can instantiate the same Darwinian rule in radically different ways. But so, so this is where I've got a problem, right? Because okay. social status is not something that I think in terms of and, and think about the world in terms of. Um, you know, I, I want to be good at what I'm, I'm good at and I do, because I want to be good at it because it, 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 it adds to my self-esteem. It, 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 it hurts me. I'm not looking for women, as my wife will tell you. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't think about... You know, you may, you know, the social with social media. I think about what other people are doing, right? Because because you measure it in terms of likes and stuff like that. But in most of what I do in life, I don't think about how this affects other people. I think about whether what I'm doing is true and right or good. And and often I lose people more when I when I do something yeah. on Twitter or something than I gain. So I never, I've never throughout my life ever thought in terms of social status or found myself seeking it qua social status rather than I want to be the best that I can be at what I am doing for me. This, this relates a little bit to the, to the selfishness before, but. Um, <laughs> that sounds like Ayn Rand, yes. Yes, and, and yeah. you know, Ayn Rand's where I come from. So, um, so I, I, I think if I think about, uh, if I think about particularly, you know, I don't know, a Galileo doesn't seem like what he's doing is to attain women. I mean, he's doing it because he's, he's, he's got a passion for the truth and he's trying to, he's trying to prove and, 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 he's, and he's following where reason will take him rather so than following I, where his need for I, sex takes him. Are you ready? Sure. Uh, <laughs> as if I hadn't already blown your mind, get ready to have your mind blown. What you're describing is the difference between epistemologically one of the most important things to know about evolutionary theorizing, and that is the difference between proximate explanations and ultimate explanations, okay? okay. Proximate explanations explain the how and what of a phenomenon. Most of what scientists do and have done throughout all of recorded history has been at the proximate level. Most Nobel Prizes are won at the proximate level. It explains how a mechanism works. Yep. What are the factors that affect the mechanism? The ultimate explanation, ultimate doesn't mean superior, it's ultimate, it's better. Ultimate in the Darwinian sense. Yep. It is the ultimate Darwinian why. Why would the phenomenon have evolved to be of that form, right? So. Even though you may not do the things that you do with a conscious recognition that the ultimate goal is to get women, your behavioral system, your emotional system, your cognitive system at the proximate level has evolved to pursue things that ultimately cater to that ult ultimate goal. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so even though you don't say, I'm getting up today to write a book because hopefully I'll get a lot of hot women to have sex with me, 
You care about your reputation. You care about people liking your ideas. You don't wake up every day and say, here's what I plan to do today. I plan to be lazy, apathetic, and hopefully say as many dumb things as I can on as broad a public forum as possible, <laughs> right? So therefore, even though you don't consciously appear as though you are slave, quote, to the ultimate goal, that is what you're doing. So Galileo cared greatly about what his colleagues thought of him, and whether we like it or not, it ultimately relates to some fundamental ultimate goals. Did you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so why does some, so I've, a few, a lot of questions actually. Okay. So why does some people are lazy and do nothing and go on you know, social media and say stupid things that, oh. that, that, are, that are turning them into the opposite of, of, of what would attract because the random combination of each of our genes that makes our unique personhoods are such that we don't every single moment of every day pursue life as though we are perfect executors of these biological drives, right? If that yeah. were the case, then we would be these perfect beings, right? I mean, why do people succumb to anorexia nervosa? Uh, why do people get addicted to heroin, right? So, uh, but, and if you, I can answer that very quickly. So it, in two of my books, I talk about exactly that question. If we are such adaptive creatures, I mean, this speaks to your point, why sure. do people do stupid sure. shit, right? Yeah. If we are these adaptive creatures, why do we succumb to maladaptive realities? And the way that I answer it in a grand sense without getting into the details, is that each of these cases, anorexia nervosa, uh, uh, pornographic addiction, pathological gambling, are misfirings of adaptive processes. Do you follow what I mean? So yep. there is an adaptive yep. process, which if it fires within the adaptive range, leads to good outcomes. But soft, sometimes it's more inactive. Sometimes it's more hyperactive. And that, by the way, cancer is that. Sure, sure. Right? Yep. And so, yep. so, so I think you could totally put within the rubric of evolutionary uh, theorizing the why we all sorts of stupid shit. Yeah. So, so I would say that those people are not engaging their reason and, and defaulting to, 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 to being determined by the misfiring. But if you engage your reason, you're not susceptible to that. So reason is, is, is really the evolutionary tool that allows us to take control over that and not to leave ourselves at the random whim of the misfiring. But do you think that in all circumstances, your capacity to have access to that that reason faculty is always there. So for example, I am a heroin addict. At that moment, uh, it is impossible for me to engage yeah. what you're calling my reason faculty. No question. I have it, a phys okay. If you screw yourself up enough times, right? If you, if you default on the capacity to reason enough times, you will lose the capacity to bring it back, or at least under, under some circumstances. You know, maybe if you go sober and you, completely, uh, you know, redo your life and you rethink it, then you can get on the right track. But it takes a lot of work. Reason takes a lot of work. Falling off of reason, you know, ignoring reason, becoming a religious mystic, whatever, um, is easy. And, and then going back to reason would, would, would take a lot of work. But I think that what makes us human is our, is our ability to override, right? Our ability to take control over all these influences, the misfirings, the... And, 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 to, and, to, and to really channel our lives in a positive direction. Um, so let me, ask you, let, me, let me ask you this. So if I am, so we know that both men and women have evolved both a desire to pair bond yep. uh, and also to stray. In other words, yep. we, we are certainly animals that uh, wish to have sexual variety. Uh, so if I am married and uh, I have a wonderful wife whom I don't wish to lose, but there is an opportunity for me to uh, execute uh, my Darwinian program of seek multiple, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, sexual yeah. uh, conquest. Uh, how would I uh, seek my reason faculty to go through this particular choice? That I, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the essence of it is to think, right? What are the consequences of the action? What is the consequences short term? What are, the, more importantly, what are the consequences long term? Does this involve dishonesty towards my wife? If it involves dishonesty towards my, life, my wife, what does that lead to? One of the best things Jordan Peterson does, in my view, is his discussion on honesty. It's, it's, his discussions on honesty are you know, brilliant because I think dishonesty 
is very, very damaging and very, very harmful to you and therefore to the people surrounding you. So, so if you're not engaging your reason, then hey, there's a hot chick at the bar, you know, and, and, right. and, and uh, Ben Shapiro has used that example to criticize many of my views. You know, if you're an egoist, then hey, there's a hot chick at the bar, you just go and have the hot chick. But no, if you really care about your life, then you stop and you think, okay, yeah, there's a hot chick on, my, on the bar. I, I might get some pleasure from sleeping with her, although again, even there, I think sexual pleasure is not only physical, it's also spiritual, and therefore it, it, it has a dimension that is affected by who you're sleeping with. Uh, just like beauty is impacted by who is beautiful. Um, and therefore, I engage my reason and say, eh, it's probably, you know, given that I'm probably going to have to lie to my wife about this, and, uh, um, and I've got a contract with her, and I'll be violating the contract. Now, we can discuss whether the contract is valid and whether there should be a contract, but, but then we'll really get into trouble if we, if we so do that. But, but, so I would say that's where reason comes in, and, and, you, and you don't act on the impulse you act as a human being. That's the difference between us and animals is we don't act on the impulse. The animal doesn't have a choice. We have a choice, free will, if you will, to act on the decision, on, to think it through and to analyze the consequences. And some of us do that and some of us don't. We, we know lots of guys who don't do that. So, so at one point you said, you know, uh, honesty, don't yep. lie. And by the way, when it comes to these kinds of issues, I'm very much of a deontological guy. There, there are absolute truths that you should follow. Yes. But then later you said, uh, well, you know, we think about the consequences, which leads to another set of ethical, you know, uh, rubric, which is consequentialism, right? So uh, a deontological would be, I never lie. Yes. It's so, an absolute statement. But why don't you lie? Okay, why, so but, why did you come to that deontological conclusion? See, I would say that I came to that deontological conclusion, that absolute, unequivocal, moral decision, because I've evaluated the consequence and have generalized that lying, given my nature as a rational being, given the consequence it has, is a bad thing. I do that once, I come up with a principle, and then I never lie again. So here's my, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm no, no, offering, that's fine. Uh, we're, we're, we're playing devil's advocate yep. because otherwise we'll agree on most things and people will get upset while these two guys were doing a, I hate that term, circle jerk. I oh, despise that term. Stupid. Uh, yeah. It's stupid. It's such a vulgar term. Yeah. But anyways, uh, so let me ask you this then. Isn't it the position that you're taking potentially unfalsifiable in the following way, right? It reminds me of how uh, uh, the, the classical economists would argue that any choice that you make is ultimately yeah. what the manifestation of maximizing your yes. utility is, yes. right? So therefore, that which I do is what led, w w I arrived at through my yeah. reason. So what about the guy who says, I am going to weigh all the calculus that Yaron just did, and from my reason calculus, Great. it makes perfect sense for me to potentially take the risk to sleep with this really beautiful girl with the beautiful behind. Yeah, and, 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 and be dishonest. No, I think that's a, that's a great question and an appropriate question. The, 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 I think there are absolute moral standards, so, so the deontological standards, that uh, you can say that being dishonest is wrong always. Now, I know that by induction from experience, that is by inducing, not just from my experience, from knowing human nature, understanding how reason functions, the, the destructive role dishonesty has in your own mind, not just other people, all of that. I know that through both seeing the world out there, understanding my own nature. So morality, the moral principle should be those absolute principles that are consistent with human flourishing, with individual human success. And, and, and that's what morality should study. So this is where, you know, put on my moral philosopher hat. So this is Aristotle, like Aristotle's project was, uh, the goal should be individual human flourishing. How, how, do, we, how do we get there, right? What, what, are the, what are the principles that lead us to individual human flourishing? I think that's what morality should study, right? It shouldn't study sacrifice and how to treat other people devoid of purpose. It should study what are the things that lead to successful human flourishing scientifically. And this is where science and morality go high in hand. And I think it doesn't take much to show, for example, that dishonesty is scientifically bad for you, for every human being, qua human being. So that if that person is doing that calculus, eh, you know, then he's deceiving himself. 
and he's, he's taking an action that's bad for him. And this is why I disagree with economists. I think people do things that are bad for them all the time. I think people are not utility maximizing, maximizers. I wish, you know, given that if utility meant anything, I wish they were utility maximizers, but they're not. They do stupid things. On th they don't think. They don't engage their reason. They don't evaluate. So, yes, I think there are moral principles that, that hopefully every human being at some point discovers and integrates them and then never violates them. So, uh, look, uh, one side of me very much agrees with you that there are a set of deontological principles that I like to live my life by, uh, almost to the point of it being maladaptive. So my, my mother used to always say, you know, Gad, the world doesn't operate according to your purity bubble. And what she was referring to yeah. was the fact that I was this sort of very, very pure guy who lived by standards that just the world is going to constantly violate and I'm going to be unhappy. That's but why you be successful. Hand, well, thank you. I would uh, say, but, yeah. on the, but on the other hand, uh, I also think that we have behavioral plasticity, uh, right? So, And again, that speaks to the earlier point that we talked about when we, we talked about determinism, right? Yeah. So uh, the same uh, behavioral strategy might be optimal in condition A, but might be suboptimal in condition B. So for example, if I were to abide by the the ontological statement, I never lie. Yeah. And then my wife, whose birthday is tomorrow, comes to me with that dress and says, yeah. hey, dad, do I look fat in that dress? Why is that the example all guys always bring up when discussing honesty? Always. <laughs> but because it's hey, we're Darwinian beings, and that's one of the places where yes. we are oftentimes forced to lie. And then you have two choices at that point. You either adhere to the deontological position or you go, no, sweetie, you look gorgeous. So all human knowledge is contextual. Okay. And, and, and the context has to be taken into account. I, I, me and my wife, you know, we, we have a certain game, right, with regard to the dress, right? And with her, the game is I have to tell her the truth. Otherwise, she'll really be angry. Um, <laughs> and... and but, but most people don't. Most people, there's a game. Do I look fat? And you expect it to say, no, you look beautiful. It's amazing. Right. And, and it's a game. And it's not about reality because no, everybody participating in the game knows that's a game. There are other examples. If, if the Nazi comes knocking at my door and says, where are the kids? I want to take them to concentration right. camp. Of course you lie because the context, is, the context of every decision should be your life, right? right. Life. So if, 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 nobody has a right to anything, including the truth at the expense of your life, right? So, so, so the life has to be, is always the context in which every deontological context, concept, you know, fits in. Right. So, so yes, I think the universals within the context, the no, you know, I, I don't consider, I don't, you know, lifeboat scenarios are a lot of morality. When you take a morality class, it's usually yeah. the trolley. You push one lever, yeah. you kill five right. people, another lever, you kill 10. And my argument, who cares? I mean, first of all, it's not, that's not morality. That's just stupid. It's, it, you're never going to be in that trolley. Morality is about what you do every day in your life. Morality is about how you live your life. It's not about trolleys. It's not about lifeboats. In a lifeboat scenario, it doesn't matter what you do. You're screwed either way. Right? And with a trolley, you're screwed either way. There's no right answer. But in life, there are right answers. So, yes, there are going to be exceptions that are emergencies or just unusual circumstances. But 99.9% .9 of the time, there are principles that guide your life that should lead you to success and happiness and flourishing. And, and, and we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of human experience to, to, to show us that it, that, it, that it tends to work. So what would be, say, the top three that you could think of that you use to guide your daily actions? So to me, the number one, so there's one that integrates all the others, right? Mm -hmm. And that's be rational, right? Rationality. Mm -hmm. To me, that, you know, take control over your own mind, take control over your own life. That's what rationality means. That's why I'm not dishonest, because I know that, you know, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. You don't want to, you don't want to mess up the mechanism of, of, of dealing with facts, um, you know, and then, and then you want to apply facts to dealing with other people. And that, to me, is justice. You want to apply rationality to every aspect of your life. So uh, reason, rationality, would be, would be kind of number one, and everything else would be a derivative of that. But Rand, we're going back to Ayn Rand, you know, came up with seven. And I think, so, so it would be rational productiveness. The idea, and this has a evolutionary psychology kind of, kind of connection, I know. It, you know, you want to be able to take care of yourself. You want to be able to put food on the table. 
you, you, you want to be productive in the world. You want to do things in the world to change your environment. It's where you get your self-esteem from. It's where we get our, our, our confidence about the world. Uh, you know, so you want to be independent. You can't have other people thinking for you. Thinking demands that you do the thinking. Right. Uh, you want to be just. You want to be honest. You want to have integrity. Um, I'm missing one. But, but pride is another one that's usually controversial. Um, but because it also goes in the seven deadly sins, it is yes. the root of all of the others. Exactly, sins, right? and to me, pride is so fundamental because you want pride. Aristotle called the queen of the virtues. Right, exactly. So Aristotle right. was the opposite of the Christian view of pride, right. and Rand is much more Aristotelian in that sense. Right. But I think I, 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 not that I wish to argue that I'm going to reconcile those two conflicting views, but I'm going to reconcile the two. <laughs> uh, in French, there is a distinction between the two terms for pride, right? Yep. There's positive pride. I'm very proudful of my work. I'm proud of my achievements yep. versus pride where, you know, don't be, don't be pride. Yes. Don't, don't have pride in love. Be humble, right? In French, you have the two terms, fierté and orgueil. Fierté is the positive connotation of the word pride. So that's a virtue. And orgueil, uh, so if you say, Ne sois pas orgueilleux. Do not be orgueilleux. That's the negative connotation, okay. right? Be humble love. So I think it's interesting how in some languages it decouples the two meanings of pride, whereas in English you use the same term for both contexts. I think it's one of the great values of having more than lang one language because you get that perspective on concepts, exactly. which I think people don't have. So uh, I, I'm going to have to think about Hebrew and whether how, well, how pride well, now works in Hebrew. It's, it's interesting you say this because uh, about languages, because one of the, well, maybe the, I hope the only parental regret that I so far have with my two young children is that between my wife and I, we speak five languages and yet our children only speak French and English yeah. and all of the other quote exotic languages so far, hopefully maybe we can remedy it, but we haven't, uh, and, and you're exactly right, the, uh, the amount that they are losing. So one of the things I talk about in one of my books is I take these evolutionary principles uh, and I then demonstrate how in Arabic, there is a exact term to capture that you know, phenomenon. Yeah. It doesn't exist in English. And I'll, yeah. maybe I, if I could take two seconds to, to describe sure, it. Sure. So, so uh, you know, one of the sort of fundamental uh, Darwinian modules, so there's, there's survival, there is mating, reproduction, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism. And I know your relationship with altruism with Ayn Rand and so on. Well, again, okay. it's a question of how you define it, right? And exactly. Definition is uh, so important. Yeah. Exactly. So in the in the Darwinian sense of reciprocal altruism, right? I, you know, I tit for tat, I scratch yeah. your back, yeah. you scratch mine. I call it so trading. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, now, in Arabic, there is a term for something that you should never do, which is when if you and I are good friends and I do something for you, I should never remind you of your indebtedness to me yeah. because that violates the most fundamental social lubricant, which is that we build our bonds of affiliation through these reciprocal arrangements. Yeah. And to do that, there is a term in Arabic, it's called terbih jmile, right? If you do that, you are, but now look how many words it yeah, took me yeah. to explain it. But with just two words, you boom, got you it. Get I know, it's Arabic. beautiful. It's, yeah. it's, I, I love languages in that sense. And I only know two. My wife now knows five, and she loves these kind of relationships and everything. She's really, um, but yeah, we had a hard time getting our kids um, interested in Hebrew, and we lost interest in trying to get them to speak Hebrew because Does she it's speak sitting. Hebrew? Yeah, my wife and I both we met in the Israeli army. Ah, okay. Uh, so, so we're both Israelis. And, you mean the uh, Zionist occupation army? Yes, the Zionist occupation army. Um, <laughs> there's a whole other topic, but uh, we gave up partially because it's an exotic language, and I and it was very hard to be motivated to teach my kids a language that they would never really use, you know. And I think I so French is great. Um, but, but practical language, Spanish, languages like that, you know, would be great. If I went back, I would make an effort to really teach my kids those languages. Well, the great, the great uh, news about my having Arabic as my mother tongue is that it is now the official mother tongue of most European countries. So when I, <laughs> so when I, so when I go to, so when somebody tells me they're going to France, I say, well, are you sure you want to go to France? Because, I mean, you don't speak Arabic. Yeah. Uh, luckily for me, 
I could pass you as can, You could go anywhere. anywhere. Exactly. That's great. I, I, have, yeah. I have two of the worst languages possible and two of the worst passports <laughs> pass possible. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. And, yeah. And somebody at some point told me, because my parents were born in South Africa, they said, you could get a South African passport. And I said, oh, yeah, I need another, another one everybody <laughs> hates. You know, <laughs> what am I going to do with that? Right. <laughs> a white guy from South Africa. Not a good idea. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So that's... Um, we were talking about, I, I get these, uh, I'm at the age where I, I fade out. Well, okay, uh, I'll tell you this before you fade out. Yeah. Uh, what are the five languages that your wife speaks? So Hebrew, English, um, Spanish, Portuguese, and French now. Oh, um, very good. Yeah, and she, she's, she's working on the French. So the others, she's, she's solid in. But uh, French she finds the hardest uh, in terms of uh, picking up, even though she has the Spanish and the Portuguese. She, she learned those very quickly. She uses Rosetta Stone. I don't know if you're familiar with Rosetta yeah, Stone. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm familiar with it. I've never used it, but yes. She, I mean, she picked up these languages so fast at a relatively late, you know, late in life, in her 40s, and just amazingly uh, did amazing. Um, and she's fluent in Spanish and Portuguese now. It's, uh, we watch uh, Brazilian television at home. So we, we, oh, the te telenovelas. She watches telenovelas and she watches the news from Globo. So she knows about American politics through the filter of Brazilian culture. So it's, it's quite entertaining. So let me, <laughs> let me summarize the Brazilian position on uh, America. They suck, they suck, they suck. Is that roughly well, right? Well, it's, it's somehow we know they must have exploited us. We're not sure exactly how, but, but we know they've exploited us. We kind of admire them. We want to be like them, but we don't know how to do it. And it's probably them holding us back so we can't compete with them. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, most of the world has this love-hate relationship with America. Well, and, and none, none more so than Canada, right? Because <laughs> Canada almost defines its identity as a sort of contra to its mean, bad, ugly brother to the South, right? Yes, you're, you're, you're European American. That we were European, right? <laughs> and more so when you're in Quebec, right? Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. got another sort of unique, distinct culture. Yep. So, uh, yep. so it's a real mess. You've got the French on top of it all. Um, wow. So I've got a lot of. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about advertising and morality of advertising, and uh, given given all this stuff, um, should we jump into that? Wait, go for it. Okay. Let me let me do that, and then we'll then we'll we'll, we'll call it a. Uh, okay. I've been told my videos are too long. <laughs> and, and then we can we can do another one. Yeah, we'll other, continue no it another problem. time. This, no is, this, yeah, this sure. will be fun. Um, so the oh, I did want to say something about pride. That's what I remember. So so Rand called pride moral ambitiousness. So it's mm -hmm. the idea that you want to be good. It's the idea that you, you you want to be a good person. It's that pride. You know when they used to duel over. You know it's like on it. I want to be a good person, and I and I stand by my. My, my honor, my pride, my, my, I, I want to be as virtuous as I can be. I want to be as good of a person as I can be. And in that sense, I think it's a positive. It, I, in that sense, I know it's a positive, but, but there, is, there is a negative sense that the word is sometimes used as. But I think, I think Christian morality confuses the two on purpose because they don't yeah. want you to be morally ambitious because you cannot, you, you're born with original sin. You are fallen from day mm -hmm. one. And you can't think of yourself as too good. That 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 there's something. So they attack the legitimate sense of pride, not just you know what we'd consider you know bad. Let me tell you a quick story, which probably will make it into my next book. I think I've only mentioned it once previously publicly, maybe on Joe Rogan show. Uh, this is going to pit the negative connotation of pride with truth. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a an interesting. Uh, clash. So uh, I was once having a conversation with a family member uh, in my nuclear family, so not my fa not my wife and I, but yep. the one that I was born into, yep. with a older male member, I won't say who it is, uh, who is very prideful in the negative sense. And we were having a conversation and he sort of flippantly said, oh, you know, yeah, those ancient Greeks, those Christians, they were they really hated the Jews, something to that effect. I said, oh, but, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to correct you. I don't mean to contradict you, but those ancient Greeks, you know, weren't Christians. He said, well, what do you mean? Of course, Greeks are Christians. I said, no, no, as a matter of fact, the way you, t you, you mark the period is that, you know, it's before Christ. So you're actually literally marking it as yep. before them becoming Christians. So when it appeared as though he could not win that argument, because just historically he was on the wrong side, what do you think 
he then did to salvage his pride and hence not be truthful. What do you think he did? I don't even think you could be so diabolical as yeah. to guess what he did, but try, take a no, shot. No, I can't think of what he would do. So then he says, no, that's right. I, I, I'm right. I'm the one who said that they weren't Christians. So he looks at me in the face. Do, what? do, you, get what I, yeah. do you get what I just yeah. did? Yeah. This is a big, excuse my vulgarity, this is a big this to my <laughs> yeah. face, right? He, yeah. he's, he's saying, when all else is lost and I have lost the debate, I will look at you in the face and, and, al and alter our positions such that I come out as the one who won the debate. Yep. This is a perfect manifestation of the negative term of pride. I'm so prideful that I am willing to violate and rape truth and human dignity in the most transparent ways to maintain my... Yep. So, so there has to be another word that that, that reflects, because it would be a shame if if we had to use pride in order yeah. to use that, because that is, and and you you have to know that that, I mean, you you have to believe that that causes him to be a miserable human being. Well, um, yeah, I, I hope he won't watch the show. I think he won't. Uh, it it does because look, I mean, part of life is to have the epistemic humility to learn from others, right? I mean, think yep. about it, right? Yep. I don't come into this conversation thinking that on every single issue, I know more than Yaron. Yep. There are some things I know more, there are some, sure. that's sure. what makes the interaction Absolutely. exciting. Absolutely. Right? So I think in a sense, you are unhappy because you don't get to experience all the richness that the world, because you know more than everybody. Yep. A cardiologist can't teach me anything. I know more about the heart <laughs> than he does. Well then, what experiences are there to learn if I already know everything? Well, and of course, think of all the errors you make if you really live that, right? Uh, and, and they do, and then they make mistakes. Because if you know more than the cardiologist, you won't agree with his diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but maybe, maybe at extremes that doesn't happen. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you might be doing lots of things that are bad for you because you're refusing to accept other people's knowledge uh, that, that is superior to yours. Absolutely right, yeah. yeah. So it, you it hurts do, you, you in many the, ways. You yeah. want to go back to morality of advertising? Yeah, so, so, so my assumption is that, that a lot of marketing, that marketing is doing a number of different things, right? So marketing is both trying to convey information to us about the availability of certain products and their characteristics and trying to trigger us in terms of these inclinations, in, in terms of appealing to us through beauty or through whatever it happens to be. You know, I, I think I saw you talk about Ferraris, which, which made me laugh because, so I, I, I knew this guy who had a Ferrari and he had an Austin Martin, right? And uh, so, it was, you know, did well so, in so life. So did my brother, by the way. What's that? So did my brother. He oh, had wow. three Ferraris and an Austin Martin. So an Austin Martin and a Ferrari. And he, actually this guy was, 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 the, um, was the CEO of Playboy magazine. So that, that can connect to you as well, right? And I told him one day, I said, I've seen both your cars, and, um, you know, I, I, I really like the Aston Martin. I would take the Aston Martin over the Ferrari. And he looked at me and he said, that's your feminine side. <laughs> he said, Aston Martin anima. is a feminine car and the Ferrari's masculine. What's that? Well, I, I said, is it anima? Is it the, um, we're, let's try to bring in the young in terms of uh, Jordan. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, then you definitely lose me because <laughs> I, can't, I can't handle that. Um, so you you're connecting to your feminine size. Got yes, it. I'm connecting to my feminine. So that I, I remember that when you were t when I heard you talk about the Ferraris. So, yeah. to what extent are they trying to activate that? And to what extent would you consider, you know, because a lot of people say we're just manipulated by these advertisers. We, you know, it's immoral because you know that's the big critique of capitalism. We're just we're just automatons yeah, yeah. that are driven by advertising and marketing. So just riff on that. I don't know if there was exactly. Yeah, sure. A question no, there. sure. Uh, look, uh, in most instances. Uh, the advertisers are doing the following. So let's take the example of fast food. Uh, they're saying the next time that your blood sugar level is down and you get that hunger signal, just choose us. Yep. They're not teaching you to love French fries and juicy burgers. That already exists, right? So, so the idea that advertisers are these evil, diabolical, nefarious creatures that can get us to do things that we otherwise would want. I mean, to some extent, at the margin, that's true. But try to convince people to eat grass juice, okay? 
and you'll have a very hard time, even if you had a $6 billion yearly advertising strategy and Justin Timberlake is dancing all the way uh, in the, throughout the, the commercial, they right? They sell those so shots of, of, uh, of that green, yucky stuff in some of these juice bars. And how is that going for them? You know, a few people do it, but no, it doesn't exactly. go well, right? <laughs> it's not taking well, right. So, so I think what advertisers do is exactly what you said, which is uh, uh, tell us about the availability. I mean, they provide us with information. And what they're basically saying is that to the extent that next time you're going to have some Darwinian pull get triggered, make sure that we win that competition. Don't go to Burger King, come to McDonald's, yeah. right? But they don't, they're not so good at peddling products that are against human nature, right? And so, because oftentimes people will ask me, okay, well, that's it's great that you've got all these wonderful scientific theories about the evolutionary roots of consumer behavior, but from a practical perspective, who cares? And then here's one of the answers that I would give, which speaks to the point that you asked. Uh, suppose you have a romance novel company, you know, the guys who've got, yep. who, you know, the yep. romance novels. Romance novels are almost exclusively read by women by all around yep. the world, right? And if you want to study the archetype not Jungian, because the archetype doesn't just have to be Jungian. The, the archetype of the male hero in in romance novels, it's always the exact same guy. He's, he's, he's tall, he's a neurosurgeon, he's also a prince, he wrestles alligators on a six-pack, uh, sure. he's reckless, and so on. Uh, but he is tamed by the love of this one good woman. It's the exact same archetype in every single romance novel. Well, a company came out at one point with the idea that they no longer wanted to succumb to this traditional role of masculinity. They were going to impose, they were going to teach the readers a new definition of masculinity, whereby the guy is sensitive, he cries, he listens to Taylor Swift music, he eats ice cream, and he cries when he's wearing his sweatpants, right? Well, guess what? Didn't Did that sell? sell? Didn't it sell. didn't sell. So, so, so that's they, the practical. But, they, but, they, but again, we come back to choices, right? Because they, there is a sense in which they can sell, right? So there are people out there who are vegans. Now, God help them. And I don't, I don't understand how they, can, you know, how they can resist that juicy hamburger. But, but they do. And, 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 uh, and, and, and I don't, I eat boogers, but I, I have, maybe it's a self-delusion, but I, I've, I only eat gourmet boogers. So I don't eat fast food boogers because I've convinced myself that they're not good for me. And I, and I don't find them appealing anymore. I drive by a McDonald's and there's no desire to go in. So, I, so I've overridden some aspect of that, uh, of, of that inclination. Um, so we do have some, in some respects, we do have some choice there or some control over these things. Uh, absolutely, right? Look, we, we have the Darwinian pull to stray from our marriage, but we also have the evolved moral calculus yeah. and therefore these two so again that speaks to the determinism idea yeah. right uh, no there are at any given point many darwinian pulls are pulling me in many. different directions and yeah. then it is quote my free will that allows me to choose from these different trajectories but if i can just add one more sure. element to the morality of advertising issue so one of the things that i lecture about when in my say in my seminars on consumer behavior is when is it ethical or moral to advertise to children and usually the argument there is that you can do so at that age when the child has the cognitive apparatus to build counter defenses to your persuasive yeah. message, okay. right? And so if, if that age is 10, then that's what it should be. Yeah. Now, the reason why I mentioned this here, other than to answer your question, is because look how hip, uh, hypocritical this is. Because we build a legal framework so that we don't target children with serial commercials because Darwin forbid they might be influenced to yeah. ask their parents to buy cereal A, but which product do we sell them straight out of the womb? The womb? Do you know which one? No. Religion. Religion, yeah. Oh, great. Right? Yeah. Right. So, so, so look at the, so, right. So yeah, the one so that will impact every, every aspect of their life for the rest of their <laughs> exactly. life. Exactly. Yeah. The one that will get them to feel that it is rational to fly planes <laughs> into buildings and they are the moral ones. Yeah. That one, we sold them that product straight out of the womb, but God forbid, pun intended, yeah. that we would sell them chewing gum when they're 11. Yeah. So there's the grand hypocrisy yeah. of marketing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, I've never thought of that. That's a great example. That's a there great example. There you go. Example. 
I think maybe that's a good one to end on. Absolutely. And one, Not that I don't want to keep talking to you. It's no, fun, it, we'll, we'll have to schedule another one because this is, this is uh, productive and, uh, and fun. So really uh, fun. thank you. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much, Yaron, uh, and I look forward to our next chat. Yes, uh, and, and I'm looking forward one. to meeting you in person one of these days. So maybe Life maybe the secret time. gathering of the intellectual dark web. I'll, ah, uh, there I, you <laughs> go. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to turn it off. Yep. And